look at these. These are good notes. I know. <laughs> Hello. What an oh, look at you. You guys are really nice. What a nice face. A lot of smiling faces. Um, we are very privileged to have T. A. Barron here. He is a New York Times best-selling author. He's how many? How many? How many children or how many books? <laughs> uh, well, 25 books that are on the New York Times bestselling list. He is in the process of writing his 27th book. His latest book, I was telling him, we had to fight with my grandson to stop him from reading when he was going to bed because he loved it so much. That's Atlantis Rising, yes. Um, he's from Colorado. He's a Rhodes Scholar. Um, he has five children. He has a wife. And he's a very nice person, and he's an amazing speaker. And I'm going to supposed to keep it brief, so he can just do his show. Thank you, Thank you Patricia. <laughs> let's let's give an extra hand for Patricia, okay? Who has done so much to make this all happen. Um, I want I will say though about your ten year old grandson um, that that is a that is to me the toughest audience to please. And that's much higher praise than a nice review of the New York Times, the Chicago Tribune, is a bright 10-year-old girl or boy who just won't go to bed because they're reading. That's, that's really the zone. So I'm very happy about that. But it doesn't happen without parents and grandparents fertilizing and, and watering and giving sunlight to that bright little seed. Well, welcome, everybody. And I'm so glad we're all here assembled in this gorgeous room on a wonderful day. It was beautiful, it was glorious over Lake Michigan this morning when I saw the sun rising on the water. It was fabulous, it was really, really beautiful. Well, I'm gonna start by telling you the most wise words anybody has ever said to me about writing. And they were said to me by a wonderful writer who became a dear friend Madeline Lengel. And when she said these words to me, I've, I've never forgotten them. And they really sum up everything I'm going to say today. So if you want to leave after I say the words, you can do so. <laughs> and you will have gotten all the meaning. She said, one day when I was really struggling over my first novel, and we were sitting there eating spaghetti supper together in her apartment in New York City, she said, just remember this. There are three essential rules to writing the perfect novel. So I dropped my fork, I looked at her eagerly, and then she said, unfortunately, nobody knows what they are. <laughs> and that really pretty much sums up everything I know about creativity and writing. You know, the truth is, the only certainty is that writing is a humbling experience. And, and I have uh, been steadily growing more humble over the years as, as each new book and idea comes, comes to fruition. But it, it began, I should tell you, when I was a uh, young lad in, the, in, in Colorado, uh, and this is a photo of my mother, uh, who is with a golden eagle. Uh, who was a great mentor and, and teacher and would read to us at night. And I would often sit under our apple tree on the ranch and try to tell my own stories. I'd write poetry or um, I even wrote, I wrote a secret expose of the truth, what really happens behind the locked doors of the teacher's lounge. <laughs> Something every fifth grader really, really desperately wants to know. That actually became my first bestseller, believe it or not. We had to print on our mimeograph machine, that dates it. Um, I think it was 490 copies because everybody wanted to know. That was fun. But the, the, the um, my writing bug continued and even when I went off to Oxford after college, I found a beautiful spreading English oak tree. This is a painting by a dear friend of that tree that I actually called Merlin's tree without ever having a whiff of an idea that someday, 20 years later, I'd get to add my own stories to the, story, to the grand myth of Merlin. And you know, I just, can't you just imagine the, you know, the wizard 
hurling some lightning bolt out of that, out of that extended arm. And I, I actually sat there, there was a fox's den in, the, in that hollow, uh, and I, I read The Once and Future King, and I began to, 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 to begin to germinate on an idea. And it, the next year I actually took the whole year off and I traveled widely all around the world. It's somewhere between the Trans-Siberian Railway and working, uh, thatching roofs in Japan and carrying bags for people in the Himalayas, I wrote my first novel. And I came back to Oxford and I thought, this is it, this will kick off my writing career in a grand fashion. I had, you know, an image in my head of living in a wilderness cabin in Colorado and writing books. So I sent it off, optimistically. I sent it off to 32 publishers just waiting to see uh, which one would be the lucky winner of me as their young writer. Well, I, I guess you could say it got a terrific reception because within about two months I had gotten 32 rejections. I mean, I was zero for 32. And you know, the truth is there's no such thing as a kind, warm, happy, f fuzzy feeling rejection letter. <laughs> they just don't come that way. Um, and they were sometimes actually pretty cruel, these letters. We've all gotten them, you understand. But I will, t I, will I actually have to, have to back down from that statement a little bit because there were, there were one or two of the 32 letters that were really so, so delightful, so humane. I mean, they really treated me with, with dignity and I'll never forget it. Uh, in fact, there was one that was just so beautiful it, it was from a New York publisher uh, and, and who um, the editor just, it was just so personal. It was like an hour to my heart. This letter, I can still see it. It said, dear sir slash madam. <laughs> it was so personal. Um, and they even took the trouble to circle the word sir, uh, which really made me feel special. And it said, dear sir slash madam, your work of fiction slash nonfiction, <laughs> circle fiction, does not meet our publishing standards for our spring slash fall publication list. <laughs> and in that case, by the way, they circled both spring and fall just to make absolutely sure I didn't miss the, the real point. So I, it's true, it's true. Um, by the way, I can tell you that this uh, in private, that last fall I received an inquiry from that exact same publisher asking if I would please possibly maybe consider contributing to one of their, their anthologies that they're gonna be publishing. I said, sorry, I've just got too much happening. I have a big creativity conference in Chicago and I'm preparing for that and just don't have the time. Dear sir slash madam. Um, anyway, I was tempted to do that too, but I held back. Anyway, so you can imagine after, after all those rejections, um, I had to go to a plan B and, and that involved actually uh, getting a job in New York City uh, in a business as far away from Colorado as, uh, and, and, and writing as possible, but uh, I still had that yearning. Even after all those rejection letters, I was getting up at four o'clock in the morning, many mornings, to just write for a couple of hours before I had to get on my, my, my suit and tie and go to the office and go to work. And, you know, I realized with time, the more responsibilities I was getting at the office, and I ended up being president of that company in, uh, about seven years later, I was still fighting for that time. So I'd write in the back of meetings. People thought I was taking notes on everything everybody was saying, but in fact, I was doing character sketches on them, imagining what they really turned into on Saturday nights when the, there was a full moon and things like that. And believe me, some of those lawyers and investment bankers, they turned into some pretty horrifying things. So it was no accident that I'd end up writing books that un ultimately would have trolls and dragons and, other such creatures with occasional wizards. So the, uh, finally the day came where I knew something was really wrong with this picture and I've always had a great sense of 
mortality. You know, life really is important every day, every minute. It's the greatest value we have. In fact, it is all we have. All we have is our time and our souls. So thinking about that, when, when there was a, another new fund and, a, and, a, and it would essentially uh, re require me to make a promise to stay around for another seven to 10 years, I stayed up most of that night talking with my wonderful wife, Curry, and came to a decision. And the next morning, which was our annual meeting of investors and the, all the, the, the people involved, I made a presentation as, as the president of the company about our situation and everybody was happy and there were nice smiles. And then I had the fun of totally shocking them all and saying, oh, and by the way, goodbye. I, I'm quitting as of today. We're gonna to move back to Colorado and see if I can actually write a book or two that somebody might want to read. Of course, I had no evidence of that, but I knew I had to really try because this was clearly really important to me to try. And, and the truth is that, that I, I knew that, that uh, I might well not, not succeed. Nobody, I might have the same results as I had with those first 32 rejections, but that wasn't scary. What was really scary was the idea of growing old coming to the end of my days and realizing, wow, you know, I really did have that dream to try to write books. And why did I let those 32 rejections just defeat me? So it was in that moment of, 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 of thinking that would be a really scary thought. That was the most scary thought, that giving this a try, and if it doesn't succeed, I could go do something else. But I knew I had to try. And that's what has led to, I'm happy to say, uh, 22 years later and 27 books later, we are here in Chicago. And actually, best of all, five wonderful children later. Uh, this, is, this is a picture taken 15 years ago in the wildflowers with my wonderful wife, Curry, and our kids. And you know, what can I say? It's been great. I know how busy you are with that, that two and a half year old, uh, but I also know how, how the greatest joy in life is being around bright, creative young people. And they really are natural sources of creativity. So, which is what we are here to honor and think about and, and explore today. So I, I, will, I will just finish by saying this introduction by saying that, that um, thanks to those kids, humility really is very much a part of my life. And also add to that, uh, because they're all faster and smarter than I am. At the, at, the, at the same time, when you write books for young people, there's no way you, you can't be humble because no matter how much you put into the book, um, they will be tough on you. And they will also tell you straight out what's not there or what's missing or what needs to be improved. I, I remember, uh, just to give you an example, uh, a letter I got last year from a girl in, in um, San Diego, actually, um, who, uh, where I had, I had recently spoken and, and she wrote me and she said, Dear Mr. Barron, I came to heard you, hear you speak at the local bookstore and I brought my mother, or she brought me, because she thinks I like your books, which I do, but that's not really why I wanted to come. And then she said, the real reason I wanted to come is that I have always wanted to write books myself, but I never thought I could really do it until now. And now at this point, you know, freeze the frame. I, I have that goofy, happy, misty-eyed look that you know, all of us adults get when we feel like we've done something right for the young people in our world. And I was, feeling, I was feeling pretty good. And then I made a huge mistake, which was I kept reading her letter. So remember, she said, I have always wanted to write books, but I never thought I could do it until now. And then she said, because now that I have heard you speak I know for sure you really don't have to be very smart after all. <laughs>
to write books. Now, I, I can't tell you how many times <laughs> I have laughed about that so many times. And it really, it really helps uh, in, in dark days to remember that. You want to hear one more? Uh, this, this, came, this was just last summer. I got a letter from a boy in Pennsylvania at the, uh, yeah, I guess it was in early June. They were still in school. And he said, he said Dear T.A. Barron, he, he kind of began his letter in a very unusual way. I get hundreds of letters every week, both on my Facebook page and the website. And I answer everybody, by the way. And, but I, this one, I don't think I've ever seen a letter that started this way. He said, Dear Mr. Barron, I hate writing you, but my fifth grade teacher made me do it. And then he said, exactly what she said was, and he puts in all capital letters, you must write to a living author. And then, and then he said, and so, if you are still alive, <laughs> Please answer these five questions so I don't flunk out of middle school. Now, really, uh, you know, I, I didn't know whether to laugh or cry, but I, 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 I thought about it and I thought, okay, he did at least say please. So um, he listed the questions and I decided to answer him back, but not as me. Instead, I answered him as ha. This is the ghost of T.A. Barron. <laughs> writing to you from the back of beyond. And anyway, I just tried to make this the scariest letter that this kid will ever receive in his whole life. And so I'm hoping it'll haunt his dreams and his computer for the rest of his days. But nothing serious. Yeah, exactly. So anyway, here we are. Um, I, I, I will also now to get more serious because creativity is a profoundly serious subject. I will say that, that the truth is writing is humbling, but it's humbling in a much deeper way as well. Um, uh, there is power, there is indeed magic in creativity and in all forms of creativity. And in, to, put it, to put it bluntly, Merlin, whom I've gotten the chance to write about many times now over the last 20 years, never wielded any magic that was as powerful as what all of us can wield in the realm of creativity. What we can do, what we can do, what we can create, what we can bring into the world and through ourselves share with others and inspire the world, that is true magic. And, and since I've shared a couple of the goofy letters I've gotten, I will, I will share one more that's actually a very serious letter that came when my very first book had just been published. I've never forgotten this letter. It was handwritten on white lined paper. And it was about my first book, which is one of three books about a heroic teenage girl named Kate. This book is called Heartlight. And in Heartlight, Kate has a special friendship, which is her grandfather, who's a world-famous astrophysicist, who has just made a profound discovery that there is a kind of light in the universe, a kind of light that isn't from stars, but instead it is akin to the light of stars, but it is found in every living creature. So it's in the eyes of a person or in the wings of a butterfly, or in the heartwood of a tree. That light he calls heart light, because in fact, if you treat it just right, it can allow you to travel anywhere in the universe, just like that. Now, they also have a small problem, which is no big deal, but the sun is about to blow up and wipe out all life on Earth and the whole solar system, you know, so. But fortunately, they have a whole lot of time to solve that problem. There's a full four minutes left before that happens. So the entire novel takes place in those four minutes. So there's no suspense at all in this book. But now let me get back to that letter. Um, the woman wrote me and she said, it was a, um, she, a woman in North Carolina who said, Dear T.A. Barron, I was just in the middle of your book 
and something happened. I have to tell you. She said, I was about, I was about halfway through Heartlight when my six-year-old daughter poked her head in the room. And before she even spoke, I knew she was going to ask me a question about our newborn baby son, who unfortunately has Down syndrome. And she said in this kind of ragged parentheses, she's asking a lot of questions about him and I'm not doing a very good job answering. And then she said, but this time Molly asked, Mama, whenever I look into little Will's eyes, there's something different in those eyes. There's a sparkly look, something different, something I've never seen in anybody's eyes. What is that? Look, what is that sparkle? And she said, well, without really thinking about it, I just took a deep breath and I said, well, you know, maybe, maybe that's his heart light shining through. And then she wrote at the very bottom of the page, I just wanted to thank you for helping me find the right word. I think about that letter all the time. It's now 22 years ago, but it seems like yesterday. And, and I often think about that phrase, just the right word. When I'm upstairs in my writing room in Boulder, Colorado, um, looking out on the, on, the, on the fields and the distant peaks, and I think, you know, it's really all about that finding just the right word. So, how do we find that? And more seriously, how do we create things that have that kind of meaning and depth? And by the way, whatever small amount of meaning that woman gained from that book, she sent me back 10,000 times more in that letter. And, 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 and that's the way it works. When you spread creativity, it comes back manifold times, more powerful. So. I've been thinking about how to describe this for you as I've been thinking about this conference. And I've decided that you have, while you have heard Madeleine Lengel's three essential rules, um, I'm going to give you my three ideas in the form of metaphor. And, and those three ideas are, are the best I can, I can attempt to, to describe this brilliant, wonderful magic of creativity. The first is making music. Now, do all of you know what an Aeolian harp is? Not everybody. An Aeolian harp is a kind of harp developed in the, uh, in the Celtic tradition that is played not by the hands of, of a human being, but by the wind. It's, they're called wind harps also, and they're, they're placed sometimes um, out in a garden or in a tree or on a windowsill. And the Romantic poets in the 1700s, 1800s used to have Aeolian harps that were, that were constantly uh, being plucked by the, by the, by the winds. And, the, and the, the purpose of them was to remind those poets that writing and language is the goal of, of finding the words that will vibrate in the winds of human experience and make music in our hearts. That, that idea, that notion of, of winds that come, by the way, not from inside us, but from Mother Earth and from all around us, and yet that we can play and we can hear and we can share is really, is really part of that magic of creativity. Let me give you one example. Uh, in, in, in another of my books that is a, um, uh, the second in the Kate trilogy, uh, the Heartlight trilogy, uh, the one called The Ancient One, um, Kate goes back in time through a great redwood tree 
to find the mystery of a lost tribe of Indians, a Native American tribe who disappeared um, into, into nowhere. But if she can find out, she might be able to save her town today in modern day Oregon. And, and she has the help of the oldest tree of all, the one called the Ancient One, which is where the book gets its name. A tree that is so old that even back in the days of the Native Americans, they called it the Ancient One. And it turns out that that tree is not merely a living organism, but is also a time tunnel. And when she enters into the tree, this is what happens. And note, in the spirit of Aeolian harps, how crucial the sound, there is one sound in this passage, and that is the sound of the tree itself breathing that ultimately opens the door to the magic. First, Kate smelled the sweet sap of the tree, fresh and potent, fragrant with life. And then a sound. Was it the wind outside? No, this was a rushing, coursing sound, like the surging of several rivers. She realized with a start that this was the sound of resins moving through the trunk and limbs of the tree, and strangely, through her own self as well. Then she heard something more. With all her concentration, she listened a distant gurgling sound. It came from far below her, rising from the deepest roots of the tree. They were drinking, drawing sustenance from the soil. Another sound joined with the rest, completing the pattern. Like an intricate fugue, it ran from the tips of the remotest needles all the way down the massive column of heartwood and into the roots of the redwood. Back and forth, in and out, always changing, always the same. Kate realized at last, this was the sound of the tree itself breathing. The sound of life being exchanged for life, breath for breath. Oh, great tree, said Kate in wonder. I feel so young, and you, you are so very old. A full resonant laughter filled the air, stirring even the sturdiest branches. Oh, I am not so young as you, perhaps, but old I surely am not. The mountains, they are old. The oceans, they are old. The sun is older still, as are the stars. And how old is that cloud whose body is made from the vapors of an earlier cloud? that once watered the soil, then flowed to the river, and then rose again into the sky. Ha, I am part of the very first seed, my child, planted in the light of the earliest dawn, and so are you. So perhaps we are neither older nor younger, but simply the same age. Now, I will read one more paragraph, just since we're all into being a tree. As she listened to the rhythmic breathing of the tree, Kate felt herself beginning to breathe in unison. A sense of her body was slowly returning, a body that bent and swayed with the fragrant wind. Every element of her being stretched upward and downward, pulling taller and straighter without end. Her arms became supple, sinewy limbs. Her feet drove deeply into the soil and anchored there. She felt tall and strong, centered and surrounded, sturdy and whole. A sweep of time swirled past, seconds into hours, days into seasons, years into centuries. Spring, azaleas blossoming and pink sorrel flowering. Summer, bright light scattering through the morning mist, scents of wild ginger and licorice fern. Autumn, harsh winds shaking the branches, gentle winds bearing geese. Winter, ceaseless rains, frosty gales, more rains brewing, again and again, again and again, seasons without end, years beyond count. 
I could keep going, but I won't. You, could, you can tell now, I hope for just a moment, you were yourself feeling like you were becoming a tree. And that's what happens to Kate. Kate is carried through time, through the life of this ancient tree. And, and many things happen. She, she experiences fire in the grove, and, and, and some, some less sturdy trees collapse. She, she, she feels the, the heartwood of the tree eaten by a kind of rot. She, she, and yet the tree still stands. She feels the whole grove rocked by a giant tremor. Some trees don't last, but this tree still stands. And then comes a day where she hears a sound she has never heard before, a sound that, that, that shrieks through the grove and makes her, makes her ache down inside. And suddenly she realizes it is the sound of chainsaw. So she has come to the 21st century. That's not where the book ends. <laughs> but if you want to find out how it ends, <clears throat> you can either read the book or you can ask Patricia's grandson. <laughs> now, so there we are, making music, making sound, breathing, and the sound of breath. That's one metaphor. Let me now turn the page to a second one. And this is the metaphor of weaving. You see, centuries ago, the story first began of a young wizard who became the greatest wizard of all times. His name was Merlin. And in the centuries that have followed, people have woven beautiful, brilliant threads as bright as the colors on this wildflower meadow in Colorado into that tapestry. And those threads are, each of them, magical. And in order to be part of that tapestry, each thread has to be authentic and true, both to the story of Merlin, but also to the human spirit. That's why the story of Merlin, the great wizard, has endured all these centuries. Almost 2,000 years now, we have been telling, sharing stories about this great, wonderful character who took his inspiration from the natural world. Well, I realized, as I, as I thought of it, 20 years ago, 20 years after sitting under that spreading English oak tree in Oxford, England, that there was a hole in the tapestry, a big gaping hole, and that was about Merlin's youth. And so I realized the, the challenge was for me to step up and be a weaver. And if I could do it well enough, I might be able to weave a few threads into that hole, the story of Merlin's youth. Now, each thread has to count, as you know, and each thread has to have that right color and texture and magic. And, and in thinking about how to do that, I had fortunately, I'd written, I'd written a few novels by then and I had a sense that the first way to make that kind of authenticity happen is by engaging the senses of the reader, all five of them. That's why in every book you'll ever see that has my name on the cover, you will find by the end of page two, you have all five senses involved. And, and uh, I think there's no substitute for it. That's how you get to the spirit, but you have to start with the senses. And that's why my goal is to make every page of a book that I've written feel as alive and as real as if you were walking on that wildflower meadow. Think about it, if you were there right now walking on this, on this ridge line that's somewhere between Crested Butte and Aspen, Colorado. You would, you would feel the softness of the earth under your feet because the snows have just recently melted and so the ground is really still that flexible. You would smell the wonderful aromas of those flowers. You'd feel the, 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 the sun warming the back of your neck and at the same time you'd feel a cold breeze off of those peaks in the distance. You'd really be there. 
in all your senses. And that's how we ought to feel, I think, about entering a story. It's the same way as entering a wildflower meadow or a great forest or a beach or a, a wonderful starry night along the shores of Lake Michigan. Whatever it is, we need to be alive in all those ways. And by the way, you can take from what I'm saying that I view place in stories not just as a backdrop against which the story takes place. No, I really, I think place is actually a form of character. Places really have to feel as alive and true and have their own breathing and have their own moods and be that authentic for bright readers of any age to really be able to enter and know that they are there. So with that in mind, let me share with you an example of what I mean by this kind of weaving. And I think the best example I can give you is how that Merlin saga began. The very first page, the very first scene of book one of what has grown into 12 books about young Merlin and, and then adult Merlin and his, and his worlds. Uh, when you enter that first page of book one, what you have is not a great wizard. In fact, the farthest thing from it, all you have is this. A wave crashes on the shore of an unknown coastline and a small boy, half drowned, barely alive, is spat out by the sea onto those rocks. He hits his head. And when he finally comes to, he hears the seagulls screeching and, you know, oh, and he can, he can taste the, 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 um, the, the seaweed and, and, and the sand on his tongue. He barfs seawater and he feels wretched. He feels awful and weak, so weak. And, but he finally man manages to sit up and he, you know, he can smell the, that briny breeze off the ocean waves. He hears the waves crashing. And even then, by the way, the waves are still pulling on his torn tunic as if they want to drag him back into the sea and drown him. So with all his strength, he crawls a little higher. Seagulls are still swirling over his head. And then he realizes something even worse has happened. Something even worse than being cast adrift and washed ashore and almost drowned. And that is that he has lost all of his memory. Every last bit of it. So he has no idea who he is, where he came from, who his parents were. Get this. He doesn't even know his own And that is where the story begins. The story of that half-drowned waif of a boy. No identity, no memory, no name. Who will become the greatest wizard of all times, Merlin himself. So where he washes ashore, right there. And that's the story's opening. Now, I've had so much fun weaving the threads into that tapestry, always with a great sense of, of excitement, but also a sense of trepidation because it has to be done well. This is such a magnificent character. And the reason Merlin has persisted over time is because of that really deep resonance in him. If you're interested, there's an article on my website called The Metaphor of Merlin about why Merlin has endured the test of time. And I'm happy to talk about that more at the end if you'd like. But now, let me give you the third and final metaphor about creativity. And that is, in addition to making music, in addition to weaving threads, I think creativity is like planting a seed. Because from that little seed of that opening vision, which, by the way, came to me in a dream one night, I, I had that, that vision of a boy washing shore and suddenly waking up and realizing, oh my god, that's Merlin. And that was, that was the seed. 
which has now sprouted over 17 years into 12 books. And, and also now I'm having the fun of, of um, a remarkable experience of retelling the story by, by uh, being one of the writers on the movie script for the Merlin movie. Now, in many, in many ways, I will say, throughout all the journeys of, of, of Merlin, um, the one constant is, is himself. And, and yet he has many adventures of, you know, he, he, he meets the most powerful and, out, and really outrageous dragon you've ever, ever thought you'd ever imagine. Oh, and by the way, it isn't that big fellow in the background. It's the little teeny guy who's in the foreground. That's the most powerful dragon of all times. And he becomes Merlin's best friend. And then there's in the great tree of Avalon myth, a thousand years have passed since the days of Merlin. And in that trilogy, it is up to three young people of the most unlikely background, ultimately to be the heirs of Merlin's power and to save the world that he began in the great tree of Avalon. All these books together, as I said, are 12 of them, including a guide that, that is really my notes from, uh, from, which is the big book up in the left-hand corner, my, that's called Merlin's Book of Magic, that is really my notes for those 17 years with the secret backstories of more than 200 characters and magical places that are in all the books. And, and so you can, you can find out the secret truth of, of how the Haunted Marsh was formed, um, why it started out as a field of magical flowers, and who it was who sacrificed themselves to save it, ultimately, and in doing so, were poisoned. And that's where it became the Haunted Marsh, or how the greatest warrior of all times in, in Avalon's entire history was a woman whose who's, uh, name was Ernalda, and who ultimately was the greatest of, of fighters against ogres who would, who would raid villages and, and such, and, some, and, and, and many, other, many other dangerous creatures in different forms. But she was only afraid of one thing, Ernalda, one thing, snowflakes. And you'll find out why in that book, things like that. So I've had a lot of fun. Some of those things, many of them, were never revealed in the books, but I needed to know them in order to have the fullness of the story of the character or of the place. So let me now say, in, as in all seeds, um, uh, they grow. And, and in many ways, the most marvelous flowering of the Merlin story is something that happens in the fourth book, the fourth of the five about young Merlin's adventures, the one that's called The Mirror of Merlin. And in that book, young Merlin actually enters into a magical mirror that, that is um, greatly feared for many reasons, but, but it is also sought after because if you can successfully enter it and return, you can have a glimpse of your own destiny. And young Merlin encounters, to his great surprise, an elderly man seated in a crystal cave, his elder self. And in that moment, the young Merlin and the elder Merlin meet each other in the, in the, in the, in the mirror of Merlin. Yeah, now, young Merlin is deeply upset because all his highest ideals have, have come to nothing. He thinks Camelot is in ruins. He thinks any hope he has to save his world is gone. He's really upset and angry. And at the same time, ancient Merlin is deeply sad about all that he has lost. The dear friends, the woman who was his true love, and more. And yet, there is, somewhere down inside Merlin, the ancient Merlin, a spark of something else, something we can call hope. And in that moment, he reaches out his big wrinkled hand and he places it on the young man's shoulder. And he says, 
Know this, young wizard. Camelot, our beloved realm of Camelot, may fail to last. But even so, it will still survive. Not as a place, but as an idea. So that way, it may yet find a home in the heart. He pauses, peering straight into the young man's eyes, and then he adds, You see, a life, whether seamstress or poet, farmer or king, is measured not by its length, but by the worth of its deeds and the power of its dreams. So, on Beyond Merlin, seeds have continued to sprout. Um, my brand new journey is into Atlantis, in fact, and Atlantis Rising, which some of you may have read, is book one of a trilogy. Uh, I have just finished book two, that'll come out next, next year, but book one, Atlantis Rising, is not the traditional story of the collapse and destruction of Atlantis that we have all heard and loved hundreds of times. This is the story, not of the destruction of Atlantis, but of the creation of Atlantis. How the most magical island on earth was born. And, and why a boy and a girl each had to, had to have a role in it happening and each had to do something impossible to make it happen. So I hope you'll all enjoy Atlantis Rising, but I think you'll also see right away that it is to a seed. And this is growing, I don't think into a, uh, a forest of trees like the Merlin saga has, but um, I have also just written a prequel. So it may turn out to be a four book trilogy before it's all done. Now, just quickly to flash you through some of the other books, there are stories for um, girls and boy heroes, there are stories of uh, the, the read to your young two and a half year old or, or allow your bright 10 or 11 year old to read on her or his own. There are tales that take you to places like Easter Island that are real and there are places, there are stories that take you to imaginary realms like Atlantis. And then there's actually a book that is about real nonfiction stories of heroic young people. This is called The Hero's Trail. And The Hero's Trail is actually uh, just about to be reissued next year with, with twice as many stories of young people. This is a book that is really about the hero in every child. Because all it is is a chance for me to step back and just share stories about kids, real young people who have, have displayed all those qualities of a hero. Courage, perseverance, hope, faith, humor, grace, all those qualities. And you know what? It, I, in, the te, in the 10 years since I wrote The Hero's Trail, it's come clear to me, not as a writer, but as a dad, that this is a time in our society where we really are massively confused, massively about what is the difference between a hero and a celebrity. Think about it. Think about the, the, the media time and the focus that celebrities get. And then compare that to how rarely we talk about and honor the heroes among us, who the heroes who really have kept our world together. And by heroes, I mean, I really mean people who aren't seeking fame and glory, but do something really helpful. They may be, they may be our soldiers on the battlefield, but they may also be that mother, that father, that grandparent, that, that really cares for a child and makes a difference in their lives. The teacher who stays late to help a young person. The kid on the school playground who stands up for someone who's being bullied. 
the people who reach out and actually help make a difference in those small ways, they are the real heroes in our world. And so this book, I'm happy to say, half of those heroes you'll meet in this book are young people whose names you'll recognize and whose faces you'll recognize. Young people like Anne Frank, or Ruby Bridges, or Wilma Rudolph, or Stephen Hawking. But half of them are also kids you'll never have met before. Kids like, like Juan, or Ryan, or Ellie, and, and all of them. All of them, just like Merlin, found themselves washed ashore at some point in life. Found themselves thrown up against a very difficult time and had to struggle. And may have felt just as lost and alone as young Merlin. But all of them, just like Merlin, reached down inside and found something magical, something heroic. And not only helped themselves survive, but helped all the rest of us at the same time. So one last word about heroes. In addition to writing that book, about 12 years ago, I founded a prize that I named after my mother. That's the Gloria Barron Prize for Young Heroes, that gal who was looking at the Golden Eagle at the very beginning of this talk. And, and because she really taught me more than anyone else about the power of the individual to really make a difference. And so every year now, we honor 25 young people from every possible background, every description, from all around North America, who have shown that kind of heroic quality, that courage, that perseverance, that hope or generosity that has really made a difference. So if you're ever feeling down about the state of the world, which is all too easy to do these days, just please, just go to the website of the Barron Prize, or go to the T.A. Barron website and click on the Young Heroes tab, and it'll take you right there. And read the, just read the stories of these amazing young people who are all around us right now. 25 a year are honored by the prize, and there are hundreds more like them everywhere we go. So let me now, let me now, before we um, wrap this up. I want to just I want to just share with you my new book that is not yet out but will come out soon. I know Patricia has had a glimpse of it, but I'm I'm uh, really happy to share with you a 1 minute video. Video some of you might have seen on my Facebook as well that is about the next book, the next seed. It's going to be called The Wisdom of Merlin. And let me just let me just now put that up. Thank you. Thank you all. Well, that is the next book. And actually, uh, I just got word it's um, going to be published next March. And it will be a, uh, a gift book. I think you can tell. This is a, this is a book like I've not 
I've not written before um, that is is the story of it, 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 well, it's really an invitation to walk into Merlin's crystal cave and to hear the magic of those seven most powerful words. And so it's the kind of book that I hope people will share as a gift for a, a, a young person graduating from high school or college or that people will just enjoy at whatever age. Um, and it's my, it's my moment, uh, which I haven't felt ready to do ever before, of sharing directly what I feel are the most, the most exciting and marvelous and inspiring principles around which to build a meaningful life. So I hope you'll enjoy. Um, Merlin's, Merlin's, um, Merlin's great wisdom has, has certainly infused my life and I, and I can hear his voice very clear, clearly, so it wasn't hard to use his voice in giving the wisdom of Merlin life. So, to wrap up, I want to actually share with you a story of um, a walk I had with my youngest child, or the girl who was in my backpack in that photograph, who now, who, who had, who now is actually 17, and who was um, 12 years old. She went with me on a walk in the fields around Boulder, where we live, and she asked me a question, as, as those bright young girls can do, she asked me a question that I had never been asked before and really rocked me back on my heels. She said, Dad, you write lots of stories. Well, how is making a story like making a life? And I thought, wow, well, Larkin, here's the best I can say is that just like making a story, you take in life what materials you have around you, and then you put them together and remember this, that you get to be the author. So your life is the story, and you get to write it. And then I, I just, I just looked right into her beautiful green eyes and said, it's your story. Make it up as you choose. Just make it the very best story you can. Well, there you have it. Making music, weaving threads, planting seeds, and walking with bright children. I think those are really the best metaphors I can give you about this magic called creativity. And now just, just one word, one last word of warning for all of you who are working with young people as teachers or as youth service workers or as grandparents or parents, remember this, that, that even in this highly materialistic society of ours, Every child has that magic of creativity. But it, like a seed, needs sunlight and water and time and nourishment. And, and, but with that, it can happen. And that's why I think with every young person, it's crucial that we help them discover that they aren't just a consumer as the media keeps telling them they are. They are not just a target market. They are much more than that, much more than a consumer. Every child is a creator of their own lives, of their own selves, and of their own world. So as you go off and embark on this wonderful conference and in your work and in your play and in your creative times, I hope you will, you will, you will recall that, that haunting music of, of the Aeolian harp or the beauty and texture of magical threads or the mystery and magic of seeds.
And I also hope that somewhere along the way, as you, as you talk with young people and create your own works, that you too will find just the right word. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, you know, we have, we have, I think, another five or ten minutes. If you would like to ask any questions on any front, I'm happy to, I'm here for you. So, happy to do that. And, um, and they can be on any subject. Yes, Patricia? You want to hear about the movie? Well, the Merlin movie has had its own saga, I will tell you that. Um, in fact, the, uh, it has a happy ending, but I, I will tell you that uh, if I were to share the entire story, it would be just as fantasy-driven and just as unlikely and just as full of mysteries and intrigue as any of my fantasy novels. But um, uh, the movie, after, after lots of twists and turns, we are finally at a fabulous place. We were at Disney Studio. Um, it was just announced two weeks ago that we have uh, a wonderful producer, the same producer who put together The Life of Pi movie, and, and also before that did The Blind Side movie. And so you can tell, I think, that this focus is really on books to movies that have universal themes. And that's, and he only does a few every year, but he's, he's a wonderful producer, very passionate and really, really is deeply into telling the story of young Merlin in a way that can be very powerful on the screen. Um, I'm, I'm also involved very much, uh, and that was part, I insisted on that. And, um, that doesn't mean I have veto power over anything. I don't have control over anything. But I do have a voice at the table. And they've been very respectful and inclusive of me. And, and so far, they know I think that I can add some authenticity that they really, really need. And at the same time, there's almost 5 million copies of those Merlin books out there in the world in 27 languages. So uh, they, they have to do right by those followers of the saga. So all of that, all of that, um, plus they're at the Netherlands Public Library. So <laughs> that's what's really cool. So it's, I'm, I'm very excited. And in fact, um, between now and going to the IRA convention in New Orleans, I'm going to um, Los Angeles for meetings at the Disney studio. So I'm very excited about that. And there is a page on my website that is called Merlin the Movie, where I'm going to be updating it as a blog. Yes? So, um, our teacher librarians bring authors in every year. Yeah. We do. We do I hear a request? <laughs> well, we're wondering if we, if we can have her come to you, because what she does is uh, buys the books and then we read them with our kids before you come, or before the authors come. Yes. <laughs> Just as a random example. Do I know anybody who does that? Yeah. <laughs> Where is this school? Is it's it? in North Boulder. Uh huh. It's called Lion Elementary. Yeah. Um, well, here's the answer. Is I, I, you can imagine, I get hundreds of requests every year, and I can only do a few, but I will always do some. And I love being with kids. I'll never be, uh, you know, too old or gray to try to, 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 to Connect with kids, and I really love to do that. What she, what that librarian needs to do, and I, you know, they're from now, not just all around our country, but around the world. And um, what we, what she has to do is, um, on my website, there's an event page that that says, would you like to be able to come and speak at whatever your conference, your library, your school, your organization, and she, the librarian, is usually the key point person. And yes, she she's the one. And she just needs to go on that page on my website and fill in the form. And obviously, because it's Boulder, I, I happen to know some people there, and uh, it, it could work. But she has to be flexible and patient. But I would certainly try hard to make it happen. And she should mention, by the way, that your 
that you're part of that school, okay? That'll help. Okay. No promises, but I will do my best. Well, we've just noticed that when she does that, the kid gets so excited. Oh, I, I know. It makes a great difference. <laughs> it's, then they suddenly realize that writers are real people, yeah. you know, for starters. And also that books don't just appear overnight, you know, <laughs> like you put that tooth under your pillow, you know. <laughs> It suddenly transforms into a novel. It doesn't work that way. But it but it's really fun. And I love being with bright kids and that would be a wonderful possibility. Who else has a question on any subject? Yes, how about you? Sort of personal, but do your kids know that you're really famous? <laughs> no. They have no clue. Right. And that, that do my kids know that I'm a little bit famous, but no, they don't. Uh, and that's just fine with me. You know what? The only place I'd really like to be famous is around our breakfast table. Right, because it could intimidate them. That's what I was wondering. Well, like, how can we ever be this successful? But, but more than that, honestly, being famous is a superficial thing. Fame is a kind of energy, though. And I want to use whatever little bit of fame energy I'm given to turn it toward doing something. And that's why my focus is that prize for heroic kids. But also, really, the job that I value the very, very most is to be the dad of these wonderful kids. I'm so lucky to be around them. That's the truth. Do they surprise you? With, do, do, are they each, any of them creative writers like you are? Or do they, surprise they surprise me all the time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can tell you so many stories. <laughs> there, was once, there was one moment where um, my um, oldest daughter was two and a half. And she was, she was, um, I had just gone a bit late from writing and, and, I, and I was just falling asleep, you know, that moment. And suddenly I heard this, this shriek from down in her room. And I, you know, so I got up, I staggered down in her room half asleep. And she was, she was, she hadn't fallen on the floor or anything. She was sitting right bolt up right in her bed. And I said, so, Denali, what's wrong? She pointed at the clock on the wall, and it had, it was exactly midnight. And she said, Dad, the big hand ate the little hand. <laughs> and I was, you know, I didn't know what to say, but I was, I, had, I just, from this old curmudgeonly grumpy guy who just woken up, I was suddenly a puddle of, of, of just happiness and sentiment on the floor. And then, I, so I sat, I, anyway, I sat over next to her and we watched the hands separate, you know, and she, and after, at about two minutes past 12, this two and a half year old girl puts her hand on my leg and she said, Dad, it's okay. It's just the start of another day. I have thought of that so many times when it feels like midnight up there. It's just the start of another day. So that's the kind of surprise and news that happens all the time. I can just I can fill two weeks worth of speeches with that kind of story. But you know the, the truth is it's a it's a it's the greatest honor and opportunity we ever get, and it's also way too fast. They grow up so fast. So it's super important to do exactly as I can tell you you were doing and you were doing and you were doing and you were doing is to be with these young people while they're in our midst. And, and um, if I can teach my kids at least a small fraction of what they have taught me, it's success. So thank you for bringing them into the room with that question. You know, just to wrap up, just to finish, would you like to hear a funny story about how I met Madeline Lingle? The woman who told me those three essential rules of writing. <laughs> this is this was shortly after I had submitted that book that got rejected everywhere. Okay, it was still very early, and I had that job in New York City. I just started. Uh, it was a low point in my life because it really just wasn't working out right, and I was wearing a suit and it was way too much concrete and all around me and noisy, cars and trucks and taxis, and I just it was I was so misplaced I wasn't it really wasn't sure what was what was happening and I still had that dream to become a writer. It was too sore at that point to try and actually give it another go. That took a while and you know where that's led. 
But in that moment, it was really a dark time. And, I, and so I just happened to be on the phone with a friend of mine who, who uh, was the director of a children's museum. And, and she, she could tell I was sad, and so she tried to perk me up, and she said, you know, the coolest thing happened, I just put together an exhibit on what famous and interesting people have collected when they were young people. And I said, really? And she said, yeah. And she said, I have Mickey Mantle's first baseball club. And I have uh, some very you know, wonderful things, but you know, John Glenn's rocket spaceship from when he was a child. And the best exhibit of all is what Madeline Lingle, that marvelous writer, uh, said. And I said, what was that? She said, she sent her teddy bear, whose name was Alphonse, and, and a little story she wrote about the life and times of Alphonse. And, and she said, you know, just reading the story, it just makes you laugh, it makes you cry, it's such a beautiful story, it's just what you'd expect from Madeline Lego. And so she said, you know what, um, I'm gonna send it to you, maybe it'll cheer you up, I'll send you that story. Um, and so I, I said, sure, I didn't believe anything could cheer me up at that point. Well, about a week later, I got home to my little apartment in New York City, and there was a bunch of mail that had been put through the slot. These were the old days when mail just came in letters, physical letters. And I, I saw at the top of the pile, there was a letter to me um, from my friend in, in, at the Children's Museum, and, and I opened it up, and there was um, the stationery of Farrar Strauss-Shrew, the publisher of everything that Madeline ever wrote. This wonderful story about the teddy bear offense. I read it, it was wonderful. And I, 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 and I did chuckle. And then I went back to being a grunt. Uh, and I flashed through the rest of the mail, it was all junk mail, until I got to the very last envelope and I saw, it. oh my God, there's a letter to me from, from someone at Farrar Strauss Chanu. And I, my very first thought, this is how, how, how still sore I was after all those rejections. My very first thought was, first gosh, That was not one of the publishers I sent the book to. Oh no, they are rejecting me in advance. <laughs> they had heard about this book, this manuscript, and they decided to send me a letter saying, no way ever, please never send us anything. But no, I had been a no way, that's not a Lingle's publisher. So I opened it up. And yes, on the on the stationery that it was that same stationery of Farrar Strauss Giroux, and it was a letter that said, "Dear T. A. Barron, I've heard from our mutual friend at the Children's Museum that you would love to be a writer for young people, and that you have had not much success." Now, that's putting it mildly. And then she said, I just want you to know that a wrinkle in time had 42 rejections before Farrar Strauss Giroux picked it up. And I thought, heavens, that's 10 more than I've had. <laughs> and, then, and then she, she went on and, she, and there was wonderful, ringing, and inspiring conclusion where she said, I just want you to know, if you really have passion for writing and storytelling, if you really engage, Commit yourself to this. You too will find your voice. Believe it. And I and I, I was on the cloud. You can imagine. It was such a great letter. It was exactly what I needed to hear. I called my friend at the Children's Museum, and, but she wasn't there, so I left her a, a message to call me. And I just, but I was so high and excited. I, just couldn't resist reading this letter to everybody I knew, basically. I called my parents in Colorado and read them. I, I read it to my college roommate out of Connecticut. I, I, I even read it to the doorman in the building. <laughs> and um, finally, uh, a couple days later, I caught up with my friend at the Children's Museum. And, and I was still just kind of jabbering away. I was so excited. And she said, nothing. And I suddenly realized that's odd. She just was silent on the other end of the the line. So I, I said, Robin, is something wrong? And she said, I just didn't think you were that gullible. 
She had forged the letter. She had taken the stationery heading from the Alpha story, put it on a whole new piece of paper, and she had written this great letter that I had totally fallen for us. Uh, and, and it was unimaginably bad. You can imagine. I was so upset. Now, not only, not only was it just as bad as it was before, it was worse because I couldn't go anywhere. I couldn't even walk out of my building without the doorman slapping me on the back and saying, oh, it's so great about that famous author who wrote you the letter. Oh, it was horrible. So I went, I, I spent the rest of that week you know, picking my posts and the rest, and, and finally, but that, that next Friday night, I came home, and I was, and, and I was, you know, just really bummed, and, and, and I, I, uh, I thought, oh, you know what? There is one silver lining here, one. And that is, I actually know the address of one of my favorite writers. So I sat down that Friday night, not really thinking about it, is there, but in fact, that's where it was. And I wrote a letter to Madeline Michael. And at that address, and for our structure, and I said, dear Madeline Michael, this is a thank you letter. First, to thank you for all the wonderful things you've written that have inspired me so much as a reader and, and an imaginer. And also to thank you for your example, because I too would like to be a writer someday, maybe, somehow. I haven't had any success, but I sure would love to try and, and to, in a small way, do what you have done so beautifully. And then I said, the truth is, I am stuck here in New York City. I'm wearing a business suit and a tie way too often, and what I really, really want to do is write a few good stories for kids. So if you ever come through New York City, please let me take you to lunch. It would be an honor. So I signed it, and oh, oh, very important. I put it at the very bottom. P.S. If you actually write me back, please. Have your signature notarized. <laughs> because I can't possibly go through this again. I can't possibly make that happen again. So anyway, I put it in the mail and 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 didn't think anything more about it until about a month later when I got in the mail a postcard um, with a picture of a, 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 a farmhouse in Connecticut on the front named Cross Weeks. And on the back, a typed message to me from Madeline Lincoln. Stamped, signature, notarized. I still have that postcard today. And so and it said, Dear Tom Barron, I live in New York. Let's have lunch, call this number, and, we, and we'll get together. And we did. We met at an Indian restaurant on the west side, and we met there at noon, and they kicked us out at 6 p.m. when they were setting up for dinner because we were still sitting there talking. There was so much to talk about. And that began a, a lifelong, wonderful friendship I feel very grateful for, even if she couldn't tell me anything more about the three essential rules of writing. <laughs> so that's how I met that little link. Thank you all, even fabulous, and thank you for your time. Thank you all. Enjoy.